I am. I'm Chris. Um, I'm from Germany already. Um, or originally, I'm a weird Twitter fanatic, so if you want to have a fully blown uh, timeline, don't follow me. Otherwise, it might be interesting doing Java for more than nine plus years. It's, it's 10, 11, I stopped counting. Uh, I don't update the slides anymore. Um, most of the time doing the weird stuff in Java, most of the time Java, the stuff that nobody wants to do, the garbage collection optimization, uh, performance optimization, all this protocol stuff where you get low level. Uh, if, if you ever have some money to spend, you have a problem, just call me. I probably can help you. Recent past, before Hazelcast, I worked at Ubisoft doing game server programming. I worked at HRS, which is the Expedia of Germany, um, doing performance optimization, obviously, for, for the uh, travel backend. And all those, the history goes further and further, and everything is kind of related to performance all the time. I guess everybody knows how a data center looks like. No? I think everybody has one at home. Who has a PlayStation 3? <laughs> Come on, guys. Who has more than one computer? Now we're speaking. <laughs> PlayStation 4, something like that. Xbox. Xbox. Well, obviously, on, um, thanks to Microsoft and even for PlayStation 3 and 4 by now, you can't run any kind of operating system on it anymore beside the original one. But the interesting fact is for the PlayStation 3, that was possible in the, in the beginning. Uh, um, Sony had officially a Linux version that was able to run on the PlayStation 3. And that was a nice thing for a lot of universities because they, they just bought a lot of PlayStation 3. It was cheap, it was fast, it had a lot of cores. And then Sony just dropped the support for Linux. And now, if you want to have a PlayStation 3, ask your local university. They might have some. Um, but the idea is, well, obviously, this is not exactly what a data center looked like. But the idea is you, the, the, the newer systems, no matter which uh, NoSQL system you're going for, all of them say, we run on commodative hardware. And we're coming back to that again. So, it's, it's not about having servers, real servers, as you, like, uh, as, you, as you imagine them from a couple of years ago, maybe a decade ago. They really look like sy normal systems these days. And if we go a bit further, somewhere in the near future, we might have, come on, switch, there you go. We might have that one. I mean, we're not far away from that. Everything on the picture actually has a CPU and is a full-blown computer. It just don doesn't run Windows, but who wants to? I mean, who wants a cattle that runs Windows? Distributed computing means in the, first, in, in the first point, we want to scale out. We're not using one single machine and we're pushing more and more CPUs in it and more and more RAM. Well, obviously, Oracle still sells those things and if, you, if you're going slow, uh, they probably can give you a bigger machine with more RAM, with more CPU for triple the price. Um, but the idea is, uh, and, and Google started all this huge um, scale-out um, system with their map and reduce operations. You get a lot of cheap, cheap hardware, um, commodative hardware, and you install multiple um, instances of your operations, of your application, and all these run in parallel. You want, to, you want to scale out. You want to have multiple instances of your application. You share the load, you share data, uh, you share processing. For Hazelcast, that means one more thing. It actually means we're doing in-memory computing. So a couple of people might know Hadoop, I think especially the guys that already worked with um, distributed systems. Hadoop um, implements a distributed file system. They still write everything to disk. They can store huge amounts of data, but you always have this performance penalty um, from, from going to the disk, writing to the disk, reading from disk. Hazelcast and a lot of other technologies like Spark and, and, and though, um, all keep data in memory. That means you have this amazingly fast access to data. And we see that in a bit. RAM is not, any, not expensive anymore, not as expensive as it was a couple of years ago. So why do we want to have in-memory computing? And I think everybody agrees we're going more and more to the near, near real-time operations. Um, for example, you go to Amazon, you search for a book, they give you some hints, oh, by the way, um, you like that book, maybe you like that as well. Um, obviously, that doesn't work for microwaves. If you buy a microwave, you probably won't, don't want another one in the next three months, but 
Amazon thinks so, so fair enough. Um, so you don't get as fast as L1 and L2 cache. Well, fair, fair point, there in the CPU, if we ever get RAM that is as fast as L2 cache, I'm the first one to buy that. Um, but we see, even though main memory is, is uh, about 10 times slower or tw uh, 13 times slower, it still is way, way, way ahead of everything that is going down to disk, no matter if it is an SSD or if it is a spinning disk. The interesting fact, though, is that even a gigabit of network adapter or a gigabit network is faster than a spinning disk. So that offers you the perfect opportunity that if you have multiple systems and they are connected over a network, it means you are fast. You're not as fast as pure main memory, but you're still pretty fast. The shard starts 1980. Um, by the way, 625, 640, does that sound familiar for somebody here? I think uh, a couple of people might be my age. I remember the 640 kilobytes. Um, so that is where it almost started. And we, we never need more than 640, right? Everybody knows that, even these days. Uh, it was kind of okay. -ish. But the fact is, 640 were kind of affordable. But if you got higher, it is $6,480 per megabyte in 1980. It was absolutely not affordable, not at all. But you see the price drops and drops and drops. And the shards ends in 2013. I didn't found a newer one. Um, and it is less than, half, uh, less than a cent, about half a cent for a megabyte these days. I, it might have gone a bit up again uh, after Japan and its flood. Um, but it's almost the same, same price range. So the thing is, the, um, the size of typical RAM, it ends at 16 gigabyte. My computer at home has 32. I guess I'm still kind of at the top range, but I guess eight to 16 is, is a very typical desktop PC these days. You get server systems with up to a terabyte of RAM, and they're still kind of affordable. If you have this need for RAM, it's okay. You can, you can buy that. It's, it's not as expensive as you might think. To do that, we, we, we see that we need to scale out. Um, even though you can get a terabyte of RAM in a single computer, it's still easier and probably cheaper to get 100 with just 10 gigs of, 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 um, of RAM. So what you need to do is distribute data. Um, distribute data, uh, do we, we, oh, you guys are all developers, so I can't there, there's no database administrator or something here that I can insult. Nope? Perfect. Um, in, in the newer days, we'd call this partitioning. In the old days, the relational database world, they called it sharding, and database administrators started crying when somebody asked about sharding. The, the idea is still the same. You have multiple instances of your relational database, and then you have something in front which has a couple of rules, and you say, well, my number range 1 to 1,000 goes to machine 1, 1,001 to 2,000 goes to machine 2. For scaling up, this is perfect because you just add more and more number ranges. I guess every, uh, every not every Java developer, every de developer figured out that number ranges are not perfect in nowadays applications, uh, but it works. The problem is if you need to go the other way around. So you start with a system uh, with five or six nodes or database nodes, and you figure out, oh, well, Mexico is so small, we probably don't need six. We could do that in three. And then, you, then your database administrators or your DevOps team or whoever, the one that actually has the black peer, um, he has to start a script that reads in the old number ranges, fixes all references, writes to new databases. They like it, believe me. I did it once. I would never ever do it again. <laughs> but for NoSQL, for the NoSQL area, partitioning is like the absolutely basic term or basic constraint <laughs> for, for any kind of system. It doesn't matter if it is Hazycast or um, EHCache or whatever. So all data partitioning systems or Cassandra, they know how to do partitioning and they can do live repartitioning. So whenever something happens, they just switch around or move around data and it's, it's a day-by-day -day operation for them. 
So how does data distribution work? And that is a bit Hazelcast specific, but it's kind of the same thing for the others as well. Um, you see this, these slides are from Brazil. Uh, it was the JCP tour um, 2015 in, uh, across Brazil. It was quite nice. Uh, weather is kind of similar to here. Um, so you're in the good spot of the world. Um, but you, you have a map and you want to put something into a map. You have a key and a value. I think all, everybody knows how, how a map works, even the C++ developers. <laughs> Um, and you put it in, and um, what actually internally happens is we take the key, there's one step missing, uh, we serialize it to a byte stream, obviously, we need to send it around. We do a hash, and this is not the Java hash code, this is consistent hashing, because we need to make sure that the same input always gives you the same output, which is not true for Java hash codes, unfortunately. Um, I think it's a Moomoor, Moomoor free thing, something like that. And Hazelcast by default, ha or Hazelcast always has a fixed partition count. By default, this is 271. Uh, you can set it to whatever you want to. And to figure out who's the owner of that key, we take the hash code we calculated, and we take the modulo operator with the partition number, and you get a partition ID, and then you can just send it to this partition ID directly. So you don't you don't have to send it somewhere to the cluster and hope it's the right node, and if not, he has to forward it you can just send it wherever it belongs to. So the important thing is here, and, and that's why I said consistent hashing, the hash function must give you always the same output. When you put in JCP tour 2015, it needs to be the same output. If you put in Israel, it needs to be the same output as you, for, for every time when you put in Israel. The partition count must be constant is true for Hazelcast. There are some systems that can change partition count at runtime, uh, but we just uh, figured, uh, I guess you already figured out if you change your partition count, you have to do the recalculation and you have to move everything because none of the calculations will, will be true from the, app, from the previous world. So that's, if you change that at runtime, uh, it pretty much is the same thing as restarting the cluster, which is what you have to do for Hazelcast. And Here's, here's the important fact, it can be calculated on clients, it can be calculated on members, it doesn't matter. You always know where you want to send your operation, your get, your put, your, um, op, your, your, your processing to. So how does that look in code? Um, we're going to the first Hazelcast. Mm -hmm. Who worked with Hazelcast already? There are some people, I heard that, okay, four, five, okay, uh, six, sorry. <laughs> some people, don't need to be here maybe today, but we, 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 we try to do something cool. So um, who worked with one of our competitors, like InfiniSpan, GridGain, Coherence? Okay, some people. Perfect. So you, you know the basic concepts as well. So to, to start up a cluster, you obviously need to have a cluster. Um, with a Hazelcast, that is, that is easy. Let's, let's start differently. We, we've seen that we have a map, and we say we have a string, a string, and an integer map. Um, and by default, what we do in Java, because we're good Java developers, and we have Java 7 or 8, we can use the diamond operator, otherwise it will look ugly. Um, we, we use a hash map. Okay, so far so good. So how do we make a concurrent hash map? How do we make a thread-safe hash map? Perfect. That was, that was part of the game, obviously, right? So, sure. So that is, that is how we make a hash map thread-safe. So the question is, and that is what we're looking at, how do we distribute it? So we, we need a cluster. Um, and for, for easiness, we're just going and say, okay, let's, let's start an embedded cluster node. So you can start a cluster separately or you can start it inside of your application. For the, document, uh, for the presentation, we're going with the easy part and that's it. We have a cluster node. If I start that up and I can prove that, I mean, I could tell you anything, right? So let's, it, it says there's an arrow, but I don't care. Oh, there is an arrow. Where's? Ah, okay, that way. So if I start that up and I make make that readable, especially. 
we see we have a famous one node cluster. Uh, this is total data sharing. Every node has everything, obviously. So far, so good. So how do we make our map distributed? We have Hazelcast, and we ask Hazelcast for a distributed data structure, and we give it a name. We could call it Israel. It doesn't matter. As long as everybody agrees on the name, you will see the same data. So OK, let's, let's, let's do some very important business logic. Day-by-day uh, -day logic, we find in every application. Um, we create a 1,000 very, very random elements. <laughs> Uh, k plus one and one. Very random, right? Amazingly random. So let's start that up again. Ah, don't make that for me. Okay? You have to believe me now, the only thing that changed is the last line. It figured out I put something into the cache and it says, oh, I don't know how, how the partition table is arranged yet, the 271 partitions, so uh, let me create a partition table first before I put that. Okay, so we, we have a cluster. Let's actually prove that. I, I leave that running, so the node is still there, and we try to, to see that actually I can do that. So we take a system out, and value, and somebody give me a number between zero and 1,000, possibly not 500, that is too obvious. 42, 42. perfect. That is not obvious. <laughs> and we start the second one. It establishes a connection. So we, we see that we already can share data. So let's do something more useful. Uh, in, a, in, a normal, in a normal application, you exactly know when something is going to change, right? In a distributed application, it might happen that one application does something, or one application instance does something, and the other one wants to be informed. So we make this a bit more readable, because we want to see something, and we do in what every good application needs. We do a thread sleep. Did everybody, anybody ever write an application that doesn't have a thread sleep? In the worst case, for a progress bar to show the user that it does something? I can remember I did this a lot in the past when it was still basic time. <laughs> so our application runs and it pushes a key every second. I think that so far so good. So Hazelcast, this is a standard map, a standard Java map. Uh, wherever it, it's gone, uh, there you go. It's a standard Java map. What actually comes out of the Heisegard get, uh, Heisegard get map is a so-called IMAP. Um, somebody might agree it stands for interface. No, it doesn't. It stands for intelligent map, interactive map. I don't know, but it, it's not an I for interface. Believe me. <laughs> but the IMAP, again, is an extension of concurrent map, which is the standard Java concurrent, con concurrent util concurrent concurrent map. <sighs> hardcore package names, uh, and that in itself is an extension of the standard Java map. But the IMAP, and that's why I call it intelligent map, it offers some additional things that are optimized for distributed computing. So for example, um, for example, bup, 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 remove. Uh, remove doesn't return the old value. How often have you used remove with the old value? But if you have to transmit that over a network, that can hurt. Imagine you have a 200 megabyte object, a value, and you send it just to throw it away. It's so nice. You don't want to do those things. By the way, Jcash does those things as well. <coughs> We're not the only ones that figured out it's a dumb idea. Um, um, there is another one. I just can't find it at the moment. Whatever. So IMAP also offers, as I said, a couple of, of methods for distributed computing. One of them is a way to be informed about changes on the cluster. As a good Java, Scala, P, uh, not PHP, uh, 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 what was it? Python uh, developer, C++ developer, we know how that works. We use observers, we use listeners, 
And that's the way to go in Hazelcast. So we say we have our listener, uh, listener, and we want to be informed it was entry at, uh, it was string integer, right? String integer. <coughs> yeah, come on. And we have a method which looks like an inter listener interface and it works exactly the same way. I hope that was the right one. Uh, yeah, that's the right one. Um, and again, some very important business logic. Uh, we're doing some logging, obviously. So you, let's, let's get into that. We have a listener. Why, do we, would, why would we have to have a listener? Imagine you have a shop system and your front end is pushing new orders. So every time a new order pops in, you want to send your user an asynchronous uh, a confirmation email. You don't want to do those things in your front end server. Websites that do that, when you push the send button, they stuck and the user's pushing it again and again and again and again because the application is just not reacting. So never do that. Okay, so map at listener, we put in our listener. And here is a nice trick. I talked about this 200 megabyte value. The second parameter tells Hazelcast, I want to know or I want to see the value that has changed or that was added, or I just want to see the key. For a lot of things, the key is, is, is a fairly good option, but you don't need the value, or you want to, to do something else with the key because you know there are other data you need to calculate. So let's run that. Um, we're going to run that two times, so we see something is going on. I'll make it big again. Why does it store the, the configuration? So we see we have a free node cluster, and there are events popping in every second, just as we wanted it. Same here. We just have one problem. Imagine you have a thousand node cluster, and everybody is sending every confirmation. I think that was the last time the user actually bought something in your shop. It's pretty much the same problem as before. This time he gets more confirmations and not you more orders. But Hazelcast, uh, since we're doing data partitioning and we only have one node owning a single key, you can do um, something else. You can say, okay, I just want to be informed when you are the new owner of that key. So we start that up again. Um, we do, again, two nodes. And the people that actually listened might have a sh clue what is going on. When something is dropping in, there is something. There is something. And obviously, the first node also owns some new data, but there, there is no listener, so you won't see that. But here is some, and there is some as well. And if we look at the numbers, uh, the key values, they're never equal. So there is uh, 333, there is 334, two, uh, 323. So the idea is in that, in that system, you only get a single uh, event. And that is most of the time what you want. You want to do some calculation if you have data affinity, so you store multiple data with the same partitioning key on, on the same node. You want to be informed something is happening and then you put off some other calculation on top of that. So that's, that's the general use case for that. So far, any question? Yes. yes. Is it possible to get from the map and get future instead of the uh, You mean um, get async? Yes. <laughs> that was easy. Give me a hard question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, so um, fault tolerance. By default, Hazelcast for every data structure keeps one backup. Uh, this is completely configurable from zero, which is unrecommended, uh, to eight, six, six, from zero to six. And you can uh, choose any combination of synchronous and asynchronous backups. So you can, for example, say, I want, always want one synchronous. And then I want to have two asynchronous ones. So I want to know that it's at least some stored somewhere else before the node 
uh, before the put operation is done or the add operation of a list or something. So when the node goes down, we just reactivate a backup somewhere else. Be beside the fact you, you configured zero backups, which is a fair, one second, which is a fair, um, a fair solution when you have a pure cache and it doesn't matter if data get lost or not. Then you can, store, uh, then you can save the traffic between the cluster nodes. Uh, I think you were first. <coughs> Uh, about the other solution that every node gets only one message and yes message. can you can you control which node gets the message or can a node say I'm not I'm busy now I can't get the message move it to the next one um, so the question is if you can if you can control who's the owner of of a new data set you're pushing not, not exactly let's say that you have like five instances of the same thing and you can send one of them the message but one of uh, but the one, one of them is busy now, so. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. Um, not not for the map listeners. So um, when the the question is actually that if there is an event and the node that would own the event uh, is busy, if someone else is going to take over, no, it's not. Um, so the, the report back to the cluster. I'm busy now. Don't send me messages. No, um, this is this is not implemented. Um, normally, what you do is you can, for example, um, use the listener and just offload it to a distributed executor service, to a thread pool, whatever. Can and you send it back. Can you get a message and send it back? No, you can't. So it's not a replacement for a distributed. Uh, um, for distributed? Yeah. It's not a replacement for a distributed uh, queue. Um, no, it's not. Let's say you have this listener, mm -hmm. which is a local input, and I have three backups. So I get an event on the three copies. No, you only get it on the on the owner of the key. So backups are not owners of the data. They only, well, they only keep backups. And when they become like the primary Um, then I have a primary key which is not backed by the action that I was counting on. Yeah, that's a good question. I would have to ask that to engineering. I'm not 100% sure. But I, yeah, that's, that's a good question. You mean when, bef before you actually handled the event, the node fails and someone else taking over? I don't, I don't actually know. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. no uh, you mean? Yeah, you mean something like um, an, so an backup. Okay. Um, in, in this case, yeah, in this case, you probably could use a member listener that informs you about that there is a member failed and then you would have to recreate your local caches on the nodes. That, that, that will work, I guess. If that makes sense, sorry. <laughs> if that makes sense. I guess that the member listener tells you when a member joined or left. Yeah, right. Sorry. The question we are uh, an active Hazelcast users who work and develop on top of Hazelcast directly. Um, Regarding the whole fault tolerance issue, so we, we came across a situation where um, the, the server, the data nodes actually like, crash or die, and in that case, like, when I even dug into the source code and saw that it actually makes sense that if this happens, uh, we can get clients hanging indefinitely unless we wrap them uh, with a timer. So, like, okay. is there any way to counter this? Um, you, this you, directly using the you mean the situation when there is um, a, wrong a wrong target exception and the client waits for a new partition table or recreate a partition table? Let's just say I'm, I'm doing a, a get from, from a map. Yeah. So basically what we did is uh, issue try locks and try put and stuff like that to, just to issue synchronization. Locks. <laughs> locks. Yeah, locks. <laughs> um, and then, like, let's say one of the servers goes down, one of the data nodes goes down. 
So basically, we, just, oh. we got lots of threads hanging. Yeah, OK. Um, if the, the problem if you uh, use locks is that the, they need to, the, the hanging or the failing operation needs to run into the lock, lock force timeout, whatever thingy. Um, you can do in force unlock. And I think, which, which version are you using? We use three, the same version you're using. Three, three, five, three. Yeah. Uh, three, five, two. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you create a bug report for that on issue? You, you should do. You, yeah, you should do that because that is not expected. I, I think it was changed in a way that if the node fails, the locks, the owned locks should be forcefully unlocked. It's not related to the whole. Um, the locks are stuck locked. Actually, the clan threads hang. Clan yeah. thread hangs. On Definitely. Okay, that's that sounds scary. Yeah, please please create a bug report for that one. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. The yes, in theory, yes. Statistically, uh, probably not. Um, yeah. So the, the the problem you're you're speaking about is that a consistent hashing is not perfect. You never ever get a hundred percent equal distribution, right? That's that's a problem. And this is especially in pro a problem when you have a low number of keys. Um, the higher the number of elements will will get, uh, the the more equal will be the distribution. Still, you can have the problem if you have a few keys, uh, a, a few keys which have amazingly huge values, and the others don't. That you come into a situation where the cluster is not 100% equally used, and um, we're thinking about it. It is not handled at the moment. Um, uh, our our solution that we have somewhere in the roadmap. Uh, is based on partitions, where we look into partition sizes and when we figure out that some partitions are way bigger than others, that we shift them between members. But this is not implemented yet. Yeah, but we know this problem. Um, most, most of the time, when you use, for example, a map, um, customers use it for caching. And caching, most of the time, means you have a lot of elements in there. And therefore, it, the equality is, is kind, of, ki kind of guaranteed. <laughs> Um, I just recently learned that Memcached by now does partitioning and that the clients are aware of this partitioning, even though the protocol doesn't know that. Um, therefore, I need to think of another reason. Um, the, the main difference is, I guess, that you work with standard Java data structures, um, that it is, well, not easier to implement, but it's, it's fairly easy to be used. Um, you're, you're completely relying on Java. Um, so you don't need to use something like Apache Thrift or Apache Avro, which is, um, which is no problem with different languages. No, as I said, you have to restart the cluster for Hazelcast because the problem is if you change the partition number, you completely have to recreate or recalculate the ownership of the elements. And that means there's a 99.99999% chance that you have to move everything everywhere. Um, therefore, it, it doesn't really make sense. It's this, almost the same thing as completely restarting the cluster. There, there, yeah, might, might be. I, I know that, uh, I think Cassandra can do it at runtime. I think it was Cassandra. Um, not sure about, about others, though. I don't know. Uh, not that I'm aware of. I don't want to say no, but I'm not aware of that. Parallelized processing, and here is uh, one version of it. With Hazelcast, I already talked about the distributed executor service, so you can do that. Uh, there's MapReduce, you can do that. Uh, there's an entry processor, which is like a stored procedure you send to your, to your data. Uh, you can do that. And the more 
typical way, as I said, Hazycast is just used for examples. So we're going into something that can be used in Spark and other streaming processing operations, and it's, it's more like a general thing. Is somebody here who's working with Scala developers normally know those things? E normally, yeah. It, it makes it easy to, to move you to that direction. So um, we, we have something, and that is not Java code, it's not, not Scala code, it's not Ruby code, it's something mixed up, but I think it, the idea is clear. So we create uh, 100,000 random integers, and we split it up into blocks of 10,000, and then we just say, okay, please sum the, the uh, or do a sum operation or some calculation of the elements in that block, and eventually we take all these sub results and say, okay, please calculate the final sum operation. So this is four lines of code if you make it fairly nice. In Java it looks a bit different, but uh, you could do that in Scala, I guess. In four lines, in, in one line, okay. <laughs> As a packet function. <laughs> um, and it actually is, is quite interesting. So up to the split operation, I think everything is clear. Here is the nice fact, the for each, it doesn't matter how we do that. We could, we could offload it to a thread pool and uh, calculate in parallel. We can do it in that way where everything is just one calculation after another. We can send it to different nodes. It doesn't matter. Everybody knows his data. I can retry that. There, there is no problem at all. No matter what happens or what I want to do, I can just do it. And here you can go even further, you can split it up further. Uh, Java 7 developers or Java 8 developers have now the fork join pool, which I'm happy that Doug Lee had exactly one method to override. Thanks for that. So Hexacast will probably never ever have a distributed fork join pool, so you have to implement that yourself. Um, but the idea is, um, we, I've, I tried to find three things again, so the, the important thing here is you create new elements. You never ever mutate anything, and that is why I ask for functional programmers. They know that by heart because normal functional programming languages can't mutate state. Scala is a bit different, <laughs> as you already said. It's it's supposed to be functional, um, but even in the in the Scala language, they kind of engage you to not mutate state and to go the functional way. Um, why do we need to the no mutation? Because we want to guarantee that there is no concurrency issue. Whenever, whenever you create new values, it doesn't matter what happens to the old stuff. Wherever you send it, it doesn't matter. You don't need that state. And there is no visibility issues between different threads because nobody has to, to be aware of the fact that somebody else has might changed something. As I said, it's independently computable. It doesn't matter if it's local, if it's multi-threaded, if it's distributed, if it is calculated by my grandmother. Uh, uh, well, maybe then the, the result might change, but um, the, the idea is it doesn't matter. And as I said, you might split it even further down, work stealing, fork join, all those things. Um, we have a second demo time. And let's do that one. So everything is shut down, looks good. Close it for now. And we remove all that because I just want to have a couple of nodes running. And I prepared something because the split operation in Java is amazingly nice and I fail all the time to write it right up the spot. So I created that beforehand. We're still we're, we're looking into that. So let's create three nodes. Uh, where you going? There you go. Oh, mouse cursor doesn't change anymore, okay. Whatever. Well, let's make that big. Okay, that works. And as I said, uh, where is it? Jux, I think that's it. Processing, that looks good. So we have a processing class. Um, let's change that one. So. Um, we already seen this Hazycast, new Hazycast instance. Um, now I want to use a Hazycast client, and the only thing I have to change, so I have a cluster of free nodes running, and I just want to connect to it. Um, and that's it. 
So the whole API is exactly the same thing. The only way you create your nodes, your, your Hazelcast instance is different. And we see some familiar code. We see a randomizer, which creates 100,000 elements. Um, we see the split operation. I can show you, and you probably figure out why this is not easy to write just by now. If somebody wants to write that in Java 8 with, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, lambdas, I'm happy to. Just give me the code. Uh, it's, it's probably possible, but uh, I hadn't had the, the intention to do that. Um, and then we use the, well, where are we? Here. The executor service. So we ask Hazelcast for distributed executor service. This is, again, a standard Java executor service. Or for Hazelcast, you can use iExecutor service, which has some more methods. Um, so I can change that to executor service, and it works. Um, the thing is, here we create tasks. Let's quickly look into the task operation. Um, the task is pretty simple. It's a callable because we want to re return, an uh, re return the um, sum calculation or the calculation return value, which, so we have a long. It's serializable because I have to send it through the cluster. Um, in production, never use serializable. Uh, it's, it's not that nice. And there's Hazelcast instance aware. If we have some people that know Spring, these aware interfa interfaces do one amazing thing. They inject values into your system. So the only thing that happens is whenever Hazelcast is, uh, is going to call this, it will inject the current local Hazelcast instance. And I do that to prove that it actually runs distributed. I think everybody knows how some calculation works, so let's don't go into that one. Um, as I said, we're running here a client. So I'm connecting to the cluster, and I see I got the result here. And we have some operations here, two. We have some calculations here, three. And hopefully, there are five. Congratulations, we have 10 operations. 10 blocks, 10 operations distributed in cluster. Obviously, it doesn't do any load balancing. Um, the, the load balancer that is built into Hazelcast is random. Um, and I often get the question, why? Uh, you don't write a generic load balancer. It just doesn't work. Don't try that. The problem is you need to have knowledge about the operation, about the runtime, about memory usage, about so many things. There is just no generic algor algorithm to do nice load balancing. But there's an interface so you can implement it yourself. Who is that? As I said, I'm from Germany. You probably know her. It's possibly the best picture ever taken. OK, last, last part, 10 minutes, 8 minutes probably. Distributed caching, um, it's, it's kind of going to the, back to the mesh map, but distributed caching is especially about uh, Jcache. We have a couple of Java developers here, a lot of Java developers. It's the standard Java specification for caching. It is kind of new. Uh, it was started a long time ago. Um, it was finally finished last year, and it does specify a standard set of caching operations, pretty much what we did with the IMAP, extending the typical map contract so the cache looks kind of similar to, to a map, but they remove the object from, from uh, remove operations. They removed a couple of other things. Put operations return an object. Did anybody ever use the object, or the return value of the put operation? I'm not talking about put if absent. So why do we cache? Uh, we collect and store when we want to access memory, or when, when we want to access something, we need it fast. So this normally happens when you start up a cluster, you, cache, you load data into memory, you warm up your cache. Maybe, or what a lot of customers do, or a lot of people, they actually have a small application that does some operations on the cache just to, just to simulate user interaction, to, to, to warm it up, to make sure that the typical data is actually in the cache before customers can, or before users can go to the website or uh, to the web store or whatever. So uh, what we do is we have fun with caches. Who knows that? It's fun with flags. <laughs> I, I, I prefer caches. So um, the evolution of caches. I'm sorry that I'm so fast now. <laughs> um, evolution of caches. Uh, who wrote his own cache in the past? Come on. Be honest to yourself. It's, it's not that guilty. Yeah, but a couple of people. And, it's actually quite interesting. You can ask that everywhere, and there are always people that have written their own cache. 
And it's, it's a typical normal thing because caches are simple, right? I mean, we, we know that. Caches are simple. You have a concurrent hash map, and because you want to make it obvious to your, uh, to your users or to your, to your colleagues, you call it cache, and you just wrap the concurrent hash map. And if you make it absolutely obvious, you call that cache, and you call that retrieve. Or, right? So typical things. Caches are simple. The problem is that's, that is only half of the truth. Um, because normally you want to remove values. Um, and a cache normally works in a way that you have a time to live of an element. So you put something in and you say, this is valid for a minute, this is valid for an hour. Most of the time for news article sites, something like that, it's 24 hours. Normally after 24 hours, your articles are so old that people don't bother anymore. So you want to get them away from the cache. And well, you might still can read that, but it's getting longer and longer. Don't read it anymore. It's not interesting. There is only one interesting thing, how we implement TTL. Well, we, we save the, the timestamp when we pushed it into the cache. Um, and on a get operation, we test the timestamp if the value is higher than our expiration time, and then we throw it away. That works if you ask for the same keys over and over again. Um, in, in general, it doesn't really work because if the article is not requested anymore, it will never be evicted from the cache. Okay, so now we're getting to the interesting part. <laughs> um, because normally um, DevOps or operations comes in and says, well, your cache is constantly growing, why? I mean, we have 200 new, uh, new news uh, per, per day, so why is your cache growing? It should be pretty much the same state all the time. So, well, you look into that and you figure out, well, well, we probably don't remove values. So let's do some auto cleanup that is just running over and over sometime. And we're coming to the second game. Uh, what is wrong? I give you a hint. There is an iterator. <laughs> I see you <laughs> not in your head. It's what? You're, you're removing from the iterator. No, it's not, it's, it's not a problem. You can do that. It's not a concurrent modification exception. It's even worse. You, you're touching the, the cache itself, no? Uh -huh. It's O on N. It's linear runtime. And normally, those things happen together with the second problem. Who knows what is the difference between executors, uh, scheduled executor service, scheduled at fixed rate and fixed time, or fixed delay? Fixed time happens. Uh, might uh, cause concurrence issues. Uh, so it's it, the the pro yes yes that is that is one. It, it shouldn't happen for a concurrent hash map. That should handle it. But the problem is, um, schedule at fixed rate, sch reschedules a new task no matter if the old one is ready or not. Together with linear um, growth of your uh, of your runtime of the task, this is a big issue, and. Unfortunately, we had that in our code. So that is not a made-up example. Um, we, fortunately, we fixed it. Um, but we figured it out when we ran a load test, and the system stopped working with 80 threads doing nothing than eviction or expiration. It was like, something is wrong here. And to, to finish the sentence, scheduled executor service with fixed delay waits until the task is finished and um, adds this delay on top and then it reschedules. So, yep, it was a trap. Um, finishing with the, the thing, custom code, uh, proprietary things, we still have them, Oracle Coherence, uh, for example, is the biggest competitor. Um, and a fully prior, uh, pro proprietary application, um, but they have their own category. Uh, you have open source, um, InfiniSpan, Hazelcast, um, EHCache, uh, Terracotta kind of things, um, GridGain, uh, now um, Apache Ignite, and a couple of other. You have the commercial offers most of the time to the open source. It's pretty much the same range. It's a Oracle. Uh, it's it's a Red Hat. It's Hazelcast. It's Grid Gain. It's all the same people. And as I said, Oracle has its own category. Um, that is that is something that somebody told me at a conference. I I love that term. Sorry. Uh, no coherence. 
Oracle coherence. But the problem is you can't buy it alone. You only get it together with a database, obviously. So it seems like the database is so fast that they need a cache on top of that. Sorry? Um, a thing between open source and commercial. However, I wouldn't say that Redis is a cache. It's, it's a database where you can deactivate the persistency. Different thing, uh, they, they might want to, let, let me, yeah. Um, you, you see all the, the things already named. Uh, Jcache just tries to be the micro USB plug and that feels like success. Uh, we're wor still working on that and let's go over that one. Uh, Apache license, so just download Hazelcast, uh, hazelcast.org. And that, by the way, didn't work in, in Brazil for some reason. I don't remember why. Um, 